title of the lesson is Christian Science. Okay, it's been a wonderful lesson, but it opened up differently for me and in three different areas. First, the use of the word power. Section 2, Citation 18. To Citation 18. Or 8. 8, I'm sorry. can't read my own scribble. In science, you can have no power opposed to God, and the physical senses must give up their false testimony. Your influence for good depends upon the weight you throw into the right scale. The good you do and embody gives you the only power obtainable. The emphasis of the word power was awfully helpful to me. It occurs again a little later on. Um, in section four, um, and it's Paul, I think, section four. The reason power is so important, always get the sense of love and principle as the base for the operation of Christian science. But now, Paul's talking, section four, 16 citation. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. And the reason it was so important to me is that what it seems to be happening in the world is that people are trying to get power over other people. And the method is might makes right. And Mrs. Eddy stands very clearly here on the fact that power comes from God, from spirit. And other power, which is not backed by good and righteousness, has no power and must be seen as a lie. Wars must not be fought over trying to gain power because unless it is directed from God, spirit, it will have no power to bring joy or happiness. And it's just uh, the sense of muscle, <laughs> muscle in Christian science, not just love and principle. So I thought you might find that interesting. Then... Uh, in section three, let me see if I get that quickly. In section three, the interpretation of proverb and prophecy was very important to me. And it led my thought elsewhere. Uh, section three, citation eight and nine. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. A man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel to understand a proverb and the interpretation. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, the use of the word prophecy and proverb and counsels made me turn to the manual and to the rule for motives and acts, I think was very well pointed up here for my study. And I found in studying the rule for motives and acts, that in the anthology of classic articles, volume three, on page 89, is the most wonderful discussion of the manual Rule for Motives and Acts. The title is To Avoid Doing It Wrongly, Do It Rightly. And he goes through every one of the 
misdeeds that one can fall into the rule for motives and acts. And he spoke about these words had long been familiar to me. I knew them by heart. Wanting to be obedient, I went over them frequently, if not daily. And one day, though, I realized how far my practice fell short of real obedience. Not only did I review this rule less than daily, but my obedience to it was less than real doing. And so the instructions must be carried out or there's no end product. So he decided to pray about doing a better job of actually watching and praying. And the article is just fascinating and so clear. Um, For example, um, Judge Righteous Judgment came up with Let's consider judging. Christ Jesus gives a vital directive in a single sentence. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And then he discusses what is righteous judgment. And then he handles condemning. It was an interesting one. It seems so negative that I expected to find only warnings against it. But no, my research revealed Jesus' strong condemnation of hypocrisy, materialism, sin of all kinds. To avoid nurturing evil, then, we must condemn it, not as a fact, but as a falsity. This is condemning rightly. Then he handles counseling, and he speaks about today's society is filled with counselors, psychological, academic, marriage, financial, career, legal, and so on. People are used to getting lots of human advice. Some of it may be helpful, some not. One way to check to see if we're giving merely a human opinion has a good deal to say about personal opinions. Excuse me, I won't stay much longer on this. Much favorable comment. Perhaps such opinions would fit what the psalmist calls the devices of the people. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. That was very important to me because when I was up at my clubhouse here, and they had the list of activities coming up, there was one that sent me into a tailspin. (laughs) They're having someone come to talk about hypnotism as a medical device to produce health. And I just cringed, as you can imagine. (laughs) And so this manual that Mrs. Eddy makes so clear what we will see as evil and condemn as evil, and not as something that's strong and we're condemning, it's only illusion and that was a great was a great comfort to me to know that our work in Christian science undoes all this idea of one person's power over another person or people as power over other people through this hypnotism, ancient and modern. So the lesson meant a great deal to me because it got me to the, to the manual. And he handles also every one of the uh, what we're not supposed to do. <laughs> he handles prophesying, to fear the future, to expect some harmful outcome, to brood over what if, to predict any development of evil, would be to prophesy erroneously. And then he explains how a prophet is a spiritual seer, disappearance of material sense before the conscious acts of spiritual truth. And he had a healing from this, which I think is worthwhile mentioning. A week or two after my study, I found myself suddenly besieged with all the symptoms of a very heavy cold or influenza. 
Oh, no, not again, I reacted, as the prospect of an all-too-familiar pattern of suffering flooded my thinking. But immediately came the realization this was prophesying erroneously, predicting the development of evil. And the remedy? Be a true prophet. Be a real spiritual seer. Hold consciously to the facts of spiritual truth until I witness the disappearance of this painful, disruptive, material sense of my being. He started immediately claiming his spiritual facts. His relation to Father, Mother, God. That he was not susceptible to any influence from popular beliefs, from medical concepts about patterns of development, duration of diseases, and so on. The only influence I could really be subject to was the Christ, the divine presence always speaking to my consciousness. And I'm skipping through, but he says, I don't remember the exact reasoning that came to me, but it was along these lines, and it was expressed in vigorous affirmations of truth and denials of error. In not much longer than it has taken you to read these lines, I felt the symptoms receding until I was completely free, and I remained so. So I think, I think the manual at the heart of Christian science is a very important thought that came to me from this lesson. And um, I think that the selection of that particular article for the anthology was really very splendid. The article itself, on page 90, has a quote from the lesson, which I think is very um, nice dovetailing. And it's that wonderful quote, and it's on the, I guess, this second full paragraph in the first column of page 90. And it's talking about influencing. The remedy is to be sure we're influencing rightly by doing good, actually embodying good, by living more consistently as the very evidence of God. As science and health puts it, your influence for good depends upon the weight you throw in the right scale. The good you do and embody gives you the only power obtainable. From page 192 and from a, a, a citation. And I was shocked at that. <laughs> when I read the article and I thought this was right for me to think about the, the manual and re- and motives and acts. That was, that was a, a good guidance that I think I got. Okay. Now, one last thing. I said there were three things that I got. And that is patient four in science and health. Yes, it is. It's the expression economy of being. Now, I've worked with that before, but I just wanted to see how it fit into the subject of Christian science. I worked with the economy of being, especially in difficult economic times lately, and it was very helpful. But here, I looked up economy of being. The citation says, both science and consciousness are now at work in the economy of being according to the law of mind which ultimately asserts its absolute supremacy. Well, dictionary says that the economy of being, or divine economy, they call it, is the divine plan or system for the government of the world. Now, that's very important. Or it's called a divine dispensation, especially for a specific period or nation. Well, in Christian science, it's a dispensation from evil for all time, that's the specific period, and for all mankind. And then there's another statement about economy of being. A religious system or code um, whose commands are considered to have been divinely revealed or appointed. So it's a religious system or a code um, whose commands 
are considered to have been divinely revealed or appointed, which just puts Christian science right there in the middle of the economy of being. So that was essentially the uh, different approach that I found in the lesson and I wanted to share with you.